So we're starting on our final panel discussion of the day. I'd like to welcome everyone who's come from the previous sessions to join us. And I particularly like to welcome our three incredible panelists. I'll start by introducing each of you. I'd like to welcome Amy Valentine uh, of Future of Learning. Amy is the Chief Ex Executive Officer of Future of School, um, a school, uh, sorry, a national public charity designed to support the growth of innovative school models, integrating blended and online learning. Prior to guiding Future Schools launch, Amy managed a portfolio of Colorado schools where she led academic and operational turnaround strategies. She also previously served as an executive director for a network of Nobel Learning communities, uh, um, Community Schools in California. Sorry, I've been chatting quite a bit this morning. So Amy, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to next uh, welcome Sandra Kuchin of Eden, based in Croatia. Sandra is an assistant professor of, um, is an assistant professor um, and assistant director at the University of Zag Zagreb University's Computing Center in Croatia. She has over 25 years of experience working in higher education, focusing on providing support and advice to institutions, teachers and students in the implementation of new technologies in learning and teaching. Welcome, Sandra. And finally, last but not least, I'd like to welcome Allison. Allison is the, um, uh, is representing the digital, uh, sorry, Allison Powell is representing the Digital Learning Collaborative. And Allison is the former Vice President of State and District Services and New Learning Models of the International Association for K-12 Online Learning, which provides expertise and leadership in K-12 blended online and competency-based learning. She's been working in the field of online learning for over 15 years, starting as a K-8 through blended teacher for Odyssey Charter Schools in Las Vegas, Nevada. After teaching in a blended environment, Clark County School District asked her to help start the virtual high school in the fifth, large, uh, fifth largest school district in the country. In her role as an administrator for the program, she helped with training teachers, building courses, overseeing technology, and educating leaders on the benefits of online learning. So ladies, thank you all so much for joining us in this panel discussion. Incredible background, all of you. Um, the, the subject of this panel discussion is well, what we refer to as crossing the divide and improving the online teaching environment. Big Blue Button was, uh, as you guys know, was created in a Canadian university back in 2008. At the time, there was about 150 video conferencing applications and nothing that was purpose built for, for virtual classrooms. So the focus of Big Blue Button has always been on teachers. Um, and up until, you know, 2020 of March, you know, there was always slow, steady growth uh, with Big Blue Button. It's an open source application, but obviously overnight, the entire world, including ourselves, saw uh, everyone go online and, and everything changed in one fell swoop. Now, um, I my questions really are centered around trying to understand, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak not as somebody that represents Big Blue Button, but as, as a parent. I witnessed three children go through schools and I witnessed their teachers and my, my kids struggle with online education. And that was the reality that was faced by kids and by teachers, despite the fact that education or sorry, technology has been promising, you know, uh, something significant for education for many, many years now. So um, my first question is, prior to COVID, we witnessed steady but slow growth in the adoption of online for learning across the majority of teaching organizations. So do you think everyone being forced to go online through COVID changed opinions, positively or negatively, about the potential of the virtual classroom? What do you think is the, is the residing opinion out there now? Naomi, I'll start, start with you. Sure, and I'll try to keep my comments brief because it's a topic that we could talk about for, probably for hours. Um, you know, in my background, I was one of the first full-time online teachers that taught high school in 2005 and designed, did instructional design around the courses. So I've been there since almost the beginning, which was around 2000. So when the pandemic hit, one of the phrases that our organization came up with was, online learning isn't new to America, Instead, it's new to most Americans. So while there is, ha, schools have been embracing online tools, ed tech tools, it hasn't been the majority of schools. It hasn't even been many schools up until the pandemic. Now, using technology in a classroom is very different than a full online program. So when the pandemic hit and kids were learning online, 
there was a, a, a just a misperception and a misunderstanding of what schools and the system and teachers were capable of doing literally overnight. So they really were engaging in <clears throat> crisis schooling online, not online learning. Online learning is intentional. It's organized. There's a choice made around it. So <clears throat> I just like to clarify that because online learning has gotten um, a little bit of a bad rap, a lot of a bad rap when it comes to people not knowing and understanding what it is. Learning in a Google Classroom and using Zoom to connect with kids, those are fantastic tools, but it's not emblematic of true online learning, instructional design and intentionality. So <clears throat> that's why I think we saw mixed reviews when the pandemic came out, but I firmly believe that whatever the response was during the pandemic and now, it's going to lead to the mass adoption of technology in schools for the long term. Interesting. A really interesting terminology is there crisis learning versus online learning and instructional design and intentionality. Uh, it's really well put. Um, Allison, what would your your take be on that question? Yeah, very similar to Amy. And I said I wasn't going to share anything, but I don't know. Is it too late to share or can I put a link? Um, in oh, the... please. I think so. Can you... Yeah, we publish please. like a snapshot every year of just kind of what's happening around the US. And on page five of this document, we kind of we mapped out a chart of kind of the differences. We called it emergency remote learning because as Amy said, it was very different. Um, most teachers had to learn, they had one weekend to figure it out, where in high quality online learning programs, they've been trained um, over months, years. Oh, did I put the wrong link? Sorry. So they've been given a lot of training. A lot of teachers were forced to um, create their own content as they were teaching it, where in a lot of online programs, the content's built before the class is taught. So there was a lot of um, differences between what happened during the pandemic versus um, what's been happening um, probably in the since the mid 90s, I know is when we started our first school. And so there's standards out there, there's training, there's content, there's technology, and a lot of that wasn't thought through for the pandemic. Um, I know when I was writing my dissertation, it was on how to plan for a pandemic because Singapore in 2006 had gone through the SARS virus and had to shut down all their schools. And now they practice every year. Um, they shut down the schools for a couple of weeks and are doing online learning. So if something like this, and whether it was a natural disaster or um, another pandemic comes along, teachers are in schools and students are going to be ready. I think a lot of people, because everybody was exposed, it wasn't such a bad thing for everyone. There were a lot of families that found it to be a very positive experience. A lot of teachers that are, we're seeing now there's a big teacher shortage in the United States and we're seeing the online schools are getting hundreds of applications for one position where the brick and mortar schools, it's, there's nothing out there. Nobody wants to teach in those schools anymore. So. Um, we're seeing pos both positive and negative. It'll be interesting to see where the policies go in this upcoming legislation to kind of see, right, this past year it was either like, let's ban all online learning or let's expand it and grow. So I think in the next year, we're going to see a lot. We're going to see where the, the if, whether it was all positive, negative, or still that combination. But it is important to make that distinction between what happened in the pandemic and what was happening prior. And Sandra, what was your perspective seeing it from the European side? Yeah, well, um, I would say that uh, it was on a global base uh, that uh, we have mostly same same experience. Um, I, I can only second what Amy, Amy said that uh, definitely uh, online education uh, got a little bit uh, damaged uh, damaged image uh, on, on what actually online education is because mostly we faced emergency remote teaching uh, and not online education but um, it's uh, it was the the situation that when teachers and high and education institutions didn't know actually what online education is because uh, the majority of them are uh, designed to be uh, campus classroom based teaching and learning and usually uh, technologies are used as addition 
to campus-based teaching uh, in a smaller percentage. Uh, there are not so many institutions who provide uh, hybrid learning or high-flex learning or fully online programs. Uh, this is uh, something which uh, only uh, a small number of them has as it is. So uh, for uh, institutions and teachers, it was the, it was the huge, um, huge turnaround from the everyday uh, work. And uh, those teachers who didn't have any experience with, with technologies or, for example, using digital technologies in, in, in the classroom, um had really, really rough time because at, at one one moment over the night they had to find out what where how what actually it is um as i'm uh, leading the e-learning e center in croatia which we, we are e-learning center for higher education institutions in croatia we're working over five 15 years now um i'm working every day with teachers and those who had some ideas or have already been using digital technologies got around uh, uh the, the the situation uh but um the big emphasis was on those who didn't use digital technologies before. They were really, really uh, needed uh, lots of support, you know, which technologies to choose, where to find them, how to implement them. And uh, as a result of pandemic, uh, in our researches, we can see that there's really growth in use of video conferencing systems. There's growth in use of learning management systems but there's no significant change in the teaching methods you know because basically teachers has just moved classroom teaching to online environment so going back to your question good or bad experience how it would uh, uh, impact uh, the situation in the future definitely number of teachers saw a positive impact and will go on and also we have to confess that uh, our students manage in virtual environment, so they did it, and they cannot be uh, any more excuse uh, for not doing things uh, online as well, uh, uh, along with classroom teaching. Um, also, uh, we have to be aware that uh, for good uh, hybrid model, we, no one says that everything has to be fully online, but for good hybrid model, we need uh, educated teachers with digital skills, we need uh, technologies, digital technologies, we need e infrastructure, but also we need um, the shift in the culture that we are open uh, to the new things, you know. I'm always uh, puzzled. Um, we have children who are using uh, everyday digital technologies. They have a number of gadgets. They're actually born with them, you know. And then they come to the school and we say, no, we are now going back 20 30 years ago just you have the notebook the board and chalk and you will have to sit there and listen and when you get out of the schools then you can use digital technologies for whatever you want so we have this digital we have this divide in the teaching methods uh, and the learning a uh, way of learning it has changed and um, definitely we have to put a lot of uh, uh, focus to educate teachers to be able to provide modern education if we want to have students or children who have skills to be able to function in society as is. As is. It's funny, Sandra, one of our previous speakers put up a slide and it said the systemic dilemma is 21st century kids are being taught by 20th century adults using 19th century curriculum and techniques on an 18th century calendar. And uh, I just thought, <laughs> I thought, oh, wow, that's perfectly but now I'm going to ask you the the the, uh, the question from a teacher or from a, a parent's perspective, because you both you've all referenced something I, I find quite fascinating, which is this idea that there's there's a big difference between online learning versus this idea of crisis learning. What's the difference? Like what's the what's the what's the uh, the optimized scenario uh, in online learning, and how does it differ from what a lot of parents or, or students uh, uh, witnessed. Amy, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, I would, I mean, nuts and bolts, you know, online learning, when we look at, you know, the advent of online learning, it, there's 
design integrated with it. The class, it's not taking a textbook and scanning the pages and having kids read it online. It's not just the transmission of information through technology. It's using adaptive software. It's, um, re, you know, attuning yourself to different learning styles through audio files and things like that. So it, the technology is used in a way that's more creative and meaningful because the instruction's happening online, the learning's happening remotely. There are still can be and oftentimes are interactions like this, interactions online, but it's more of a flipped model, right? The students doing the reading, they're doing the work, and then they're coming to meet with their teachers to ask questions and fill in what, what they're struggling with or what they want to expand upon. So whereas some one might not think it's customized, it's very customized. It has the potential to be very customized. Teachers can focus on instruction. It takes out, for the most part, the classroom management piece. So there's the design piece of it the intentionality, teachers are trained. They're trained to use the tools that, that their online system is running on to be able to meet learners where they are. Um, technology doesn't judge kids for getting not getting a good grade or for struggling with content, right? It's the technology can adapt and meet learners where they are. And it's, a, it's a, been a choice. Historically, it's been a choice. So I think that's where when the pandemic hit, you know, crisis schooling, emergency remote learning, it was and I give people across the world great credit for keeping kids connected however they could. So I know there's a lot of criticism of this crisis and emergency remote learning, but I tend to look at, you know, the glasses overflowing and how beautiful was it that we were able to get kids laptops to be able to provide teachers with Wi-Fi hotspots. But the difference was it was connecting them using technology and then building whatever could be built to be able to provide instruction for them. There wasn't time for training. There wasn't time to make sure that high-speed high internets were set up. There wasn't even time to make sure that on, in many cases that kids' IEPs and their 504s were being implemented. So it was a just-in-time, you know, it was all, I call it this Maslow's hierarchy of, of technical or online needs. What is being met first? We need to get them online. We need to keep them connected. We need to make sure that we can keep a pulse on how they're doing. So it's to me, it's the difference between going to the emergency room when you're having a medical issue versus knowing that there's some sort of preventative care out there that you can do that's off the beaten path and doing that instead of waiting for a crisis to hit. Hmm. What was interesting to me is how shocked people were that we weren't prepared for it. But I guess I've been in education and, you know, one meeting I had with Allison shortly after the pandemic hit, I said, I said, whoever would have thought this would have happened? And she reminded me about her dissertation. And I was like, that's right. You're probably the only person I know who has done some sort of planning for a situation like this. Because even those of us in education, you know, I don't know that we could have planned for something like this. So there was a lot of great things that happened out of it. And I think it's easy to look at the negatives and not look at the fact of, okay, we've come a long way in a short period of time moving towards effective intentional online learning. Well, so if we had a do-over, um what would we change going into the next wave of covid or the next whatever the whatever pandemic is coming up like what did they learn in in um singapore that we need to be applying here Allison? i can go into that one so i think it was kind of a shock to them in 2006 just like the world whole world experienced when SARS hit and so they have like changed at the higher education level there's now teacher training for pre-service teachers um, I think that's just being in this field for so long that's been the slowest group is most teachers get a little technology class on how to use Microsoft Office products and maybe some apps and stuff but they're not learning the how to change their pedagogy. Um, it is different from being in person and online and having both skill sets is really important. Um, we've developed standards that I just posted that are kind of the things that we found in both the research and practice and what works in online hybrid um, environments and just exposing teachers to that so they have at least some basic skills and aren't trying to you can't replicate what's happening in the face-to-face -face class in an online class. It just, kids don't wanna sit on big blue button for eight hours a day listening to somebody talk. So how can you use 
these different tools to engage students and really get to know them. And um, we found that social emotional learning was really important um, and that ever since the very first online school we created, our tagline was every student has a front row seat because the teacher, you really get to know your students one on one and can really customize their learning experiences, Amy said. But it is different because you're not sitting in front of them. You don't see what their physical and um, expressions are and how they're behaving in the classroom and what's happening at home. And teachers did get a good look into that um, throughout the pandemic. So we did learn a lot and we're um, updating some of these standards and the things we've learned because there were new things that were tried that we didn't necessarily do before the pandemic that have really enhanced the learning experience. And so I think it starts with the teachers and being prepared. I think the pandemic, we did a good job of getting the infrastructure down, getting kids access to, in most places, not, we're not quite there yet, but to internet access to devices. And so I think that piece is connected as long as we keep updating those over the years and just don't let those contracts expire and we go back to the, everything we did before. I think in the physical face-to-face -face classroom, um, we've learned ways where we can create hybrid environments and continue the online learning because not every kid can do full-time online learning. We found other services that schools provide that were necessities for a lot of families, where like the babysitting services, the food services, those things are important too, that they might not get in an online environment. So just having those things prepared, we learned a lot. So it's just not forgetting about it and continuously practicing because it might not be a pandemic. It could be a snowstorm or a hurricane or some kind of a natural disaster, but there's always gonna be a need for this. And so just making sure that teachers are prepared. We have time now to start changing programs for teacher trainings and, um, starting to give them some of those skills that are important to be successful in these new environments. Hmm. Sandra, what's your take? What would we do? What would we change going to the next? Well, um, definitely, uh, it, it was a huge, uh, huge change. Uh, and as Amy said, uh, uh, online education takes time uh, to design and to be specifically designed for being online. So what we need to do is to raise awareness of people, uh, teachers, um, institutions, uh, policymakers, parents, community, what actually online education is and how can digital technologies can be implemented into the education. So they have to be aware of this uh, uh, these items, uh, I would say, um, because uh, sometimes, you know, I hear from teachers, okay, I have PowerPoints, I'm doing e-learning. Okay, that's not, uh, uh, I have uh, uh, lectures, classroom lectures via big blue button, I'm doing online education. This is not online education. So we have to be, uh, to raise awareness uh, about what actually online education is. Online education is nothing new, it exists for really a big number of years. Well, we have online universities who are really high on the high level uh, um, uh, of the quality uh, uh, throughout the world, you know. Uh, so um, we have to be aware uh, on a difference of when we say online education, uh, e-learning, blended learning, hybrid learning. So we know we, we have to know what is behind that. Also, what we need to do is to invest into teachers. You know, uh, they have been educated in one way and now they have to do uh, things in a different way. The second, uh, thirdly, institutions need resilience plan for education. You know, they have to be prepared. As Alison said, it was pandemic. For example, Croatia was hit by earthquake as well. So. It was two out of three, I would say, you know, uh, so you never know what can happen next. But what we have is that um, we have parents who have sent their children to the schools, you know, they didn't imagine these children will study online. So two years of doing emergency remote teaching is quite a long time. And definitely all of us are fed up with this. I'm also tired of being constantly online and doing number of video conferencing system every day. And I, I have all, all 
uh, problems in finding all the links uh, for which session I need to go to which video conferencing system. So, but that experience is not experience of online education and we have to be aware that, of that. And everyone says we are social beings, we need the contact. Yes, we need the contact, but first of all, we have to be aware of the possibilities of online environment and what can technology bring into education. And when we know that, then we will be able to decide, do we want blended learning, hybrid learning, or fully online learning? It has to be intentional for, for concrete reason. You know, we mm. have to know what we want to do. And uh, at the end, um, we have to educate uh, teachers. We also have to educate the children and the students because although they are tech savvy, they know how to do everything online uh, regarding communication, finding information, everything. They do not know how to learn online. Mm. We have to educate and show them how to do, how to do time management, how to do interaction, how to do communication, how to, how to connect with others. Uh, what does it mean to be behind the screen and not going to the to physically to premises to, to meet some, uh, someone? Some of the students can be shy, some can be very extrovert and, and, and uh, aggressive in, in their uh, uh, communication. So we need to invest in that. It has to be national priority, but not only as a political issue. It needs concrete steps. It will be. It will be uh, tiresome in finances, but also in human resources. Basically, we need to do digital transformation of education. It's complex, it takes time, it's messy, but it's something we need today and we have to do it. That's really interesting. So what are each of you works or collaborates with learning organizations that are leading or certainly actively embracing online learning? What are these? What do those organizations see as the true potential of online learning? And how far are we away from that potential? And Sandra, I'll start with you on that, in that case. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, Eden is present for 30 years in Europe, uh, trying to connect all those doing um, education, um, e-learning, open education, distance education. And when pandemic hit, um, we started with the initiative, which was called uh, Online Together, Webinars Online Together. These were practical webinars, helping teachers and educators, everyone doing uh, with education, to get around the online environment. And I was very happy that we managed to start with these webinars on March 30, 2020. So basically after 15 days when we had the, the worst lockdown. And it shows how community is strong because whoever we ask to share their expertise and know-how, they were very eager to help and to, to tell uh, and, and to show what they know and to, to try to, to give some guidelines. And this is the strength of the community. I would say that the, uh, the, the result of the pandemic is the, the new race of communities of practice because people find out that they can connect on a global level, that, that because they are at, uh, locked at home, it doesn't mean that they cannot get connected with mm. others. And not only... Oh, shoot. Technology not at its finest. <clears throat> Small Alice, neighborhood, you... but with people throughout the world. I would say uh, the, the fears, uh, the mistakes, you know, so it, it was bonding. And I think that that was that was something really significant uh, and, and strong. And um, I see that uh, potential of an organization as Eden is in bringing this community, providing the platform, you know, for people to be able to com connect, to communicate, collaborate and give the guidelines to, to some new things. Uh, and also we are very happy that we communicate and collaborate with the European Commission very much. So um, we can give them our expertise in um, uh, preparing the new policies guidelines, but also we can serve as a communication channel for their, uh, for their guidelines policies uh, towards the community. So this is a win-win situation and I think uh, it's very important. Hmm. Interesting. So, so Alison, do you, what is the true potential of online learning? 
Um, I think there's kind of two right now. I think it's giving access to students, no matter where they live, to teachers, to courses and um, content and other resources and communities that they might not otherwise have access to. I think that's kind of where it started um, and it, that potential is there, it's growing um, and it's just gonna get bigger and better um, after the pandemic. But I think if you're looking at the future, I think the real biggest potential is like true personalization of learning for students. And I think the technology is getting there, but it's kind of like if you can imagine having a GPS set up for each student and they can program what their goals are and a GPS can reroute them if you change your end destination. But you have that teacher has all the data and teams of teachers around them or other specialists, therapists, they know what the learning goals are and how each student might go a little, like Amy might go a little bit slower and Sandra's a little bit faster and you can go on little side trips and see other things and that might change your experience. But that, that technology is really gonna allow them to work at their own pace, to take courses, um, that are interesting to them to give them different ways to learn the content. If they're not successful the first time watching a video about it, they might be able to read or play a game or go into the metaverse when that gets here. And all there's so much potential for what you can do online and whether that's fully online or hybrid opportunities, I think that's probably the biggest potential. I think we're still a ways away from that, but it's getting there and just allowing kids to still connect with their communities and their peers, but to really reach their own learning goals and what they want to do after they get out of school and give them a path of success to get there and a team of support around them. Mm, interesting. So what needs to change to achieve that potential is, I mean, what I think you're suggesting, or you said at the beginning, uh, Allison, is that um, more online education is an inevitability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think no matter where a student goes after school, um, they're going to have to take their, some kind of an online class, whether they go into higher ed, if they go work at McDonald's, whatever career path they choose, they're going to at some point have to go online and take some kind of a learning, whether it's a full class or a seminar like we're doing today. So they need those tools and you get a lot of extra skills that you might not like time management. Um, is a big one that a lot of kids say after taking a class, like I wouldn't have learned that in my traditional school. So you're getting a whole nother set of skills that they can use after high school. Um, and they're gonna be exposed to that no matter what they choose to do. Um, Michigan here in the US in 2006, the auto industry was starting to fail and they realized that and that's where most of their students went to work and so they saw the potential of online learning and now require students to take at least one class online in order to graduate high school. And there's, I think, nine, nine states total now that have some kind of requirement. Districts are doing that because they know kids are going to have to take it. And so what it looks like now might be different in 10 years from now, but I think we're getting there as the technology evolves hmm. and more and more people are exposed to this and getting training. So, Amy, same to you. What needs to change to achieve the the kind of potential scenarios that uh, that Allison was referencing? The idea of personalization, working at your own pace, choosing courses of interest, etc. What has to change in the system to make that a possibility? So, I already said that I'm a self-proclaimed glasses overflowing. So, the comment I'm going to make is going to sound like the glasses half full. So, I just want to put that um, that note ahead of time. Because one of the things in running the national public charity is I get this I get this bird's eye view of what's happening, and so I think we're our country is going to reach a tipping point for change, and we don't need 51% of parents or educators or students to get to that point. We only need 14%, and so people will demand options for their kids. They're going to demand that there are highly qualified teachers for their kids. They're going to demand that we don't short change what, um, you know, what requirements are to make sure that we have highly qualified teachers for kids and between budget cuts and the teacher shortage, which Allison had talked about, the only way that we're going to be able to provide high quality education to kids is leveraging blended learning, online learning, in light of the fact that 
students are more mobile now. Students are attending different schools. There are being homeschooled, there's micro schools. So unfortunately, as schools are losing enrollments in the US and losing money, that means they have to change and modify their budgets. And teaching is a really hard position to be in. I was a, you know, did some under some, I called it undercover substitute teaching, but guest teaching last year to have my ear to the ground to be able to hear and see what's going on in classrooms. And it is, it's difficult, it's challenging. And so in light of the changes that are happening, technology is the only way that schools would be able to offer a wide breadth and depth of courses and high, offer high quality teachers who are trained, who can meet students where they are. So I think it's gonna be a tipping point where people are gonna demand the change and that will cause policies to shift. And we've seen it happen in our country over the last few years in other, in other verticals and other areas. And I think we're reaching that point. So I think that the, the positive is the potential for online learning to help prepare kids for their futures in K-12 schools, it's infinite. We don't even, I can't even imagine what schools will look like in five, five years. But if what I do know is we cannot continue doing what we're doing right now because it's, it's just simply not working for kids. Do you know, last year we, we had our first conference <clears throat> and one of the things that came up was uh, the number of educators that were struck by the, the amount of children that didn't have access to technology. You know, I interviewed a fellow that was the head of technology for the Anaheim School District. You know, you're talking about basically stone's throw from Silicon Valley. 30,000 kids in the district, 70% 70, 70 of them were poor, 10,000 of them didn't have computers, and 50% of them didn't have Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's like, okay, if those are the numbers, I mean, one of the big things changes. Do you think that, do you think that COVID has made access to technology easier for those families and for those kids? <clears throat> Any, Allison, do you want to start? Yeah, definitely. I think that was kind of where everybody started was how do we get the technology to them? And they were very creative. So they had to, like, especially in the rural areas, and that's all over the world. Like, how do you get Wi-Fi to it's a house in the middle of nowhere? And so hotspots were kind of popular where they give them one to, for their house. Um, we saw a lot of parking of buses in areas that were set up with Wi-Fi. And so I think we've, and then we've got devices now. I think most schools are probably one-to-one. -one. That was kind of the easiest first step and then the Wi-Fi, and then they had their, in their schools, the technology infrastructures, create bot learning management systems and video conferencing systems. And so I feel like the technology where we're close. I think there's still some families that they just couldn't get internet to. And so they were still mailing packets and doing phone calls and stuff like that. But I think that area we're now prepared, but it's keeping that technology going and updated over the next few years. Like we've got it now, but technology evolves quickly and devices are expensive to replace and kids don't always take the best care of them. So how do we keep that in the budget and make sure that it's important so these things can go on. But I think that's one area where COVID really helped out and really kickstarted and got everybody, almost everybody access to this so they can participate in these kinds of our, environments. Our first keynote speaker was from UNESCO and they said, I mean, it's, it's uh, easy to forget that we all operate in bubbles of our own. And he was, <laughs> he's looking at it from the global perspective and say, well, in fact, in that that member country, we were using the radio as the vehicle for delivering lectures. Yeah, like, oh yeah, TVs. But our first school, um, our district owned the local PBS station, so we had we would broadcast classes on the TV. And so I know <laughs> some countries I've read that used a lot of the radio and TV as well, if because most families had access to that. But I know it all started with the radio and the mail system, like back in Australia, New Zealand, and some of those more rural countries to give kids access. So that's kind of where it started. And in some places, that's all they have access to. So they yeah. continue to do it that way. I'd like to open up the floor to our to the people who've joined and are listening in. If you have questions, if you'd like to type them into the chat, because we are coming up uh, to the end of the session. Uh, so please feel free to post your uh, post your questions. 
What would be, I mean, you have offered some of this uh, through the course of your, your responses. But I'm going to ask you guys, what would the advice be to, what would you offer institutions, teachers, and parents as a way to improve the experience of online learning? Let's start with parents. What is, what's the advice that you'd offer to parents to improve the experience for their children in all, learning online? Sandra, do you want to start? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, uh, <laughs> first, uh, the issue is that the parents are digitally skilled enough to understand uh, the, the, the learning in online environment because uh, often they are not uh, skilled enough to understand uh, the process. So they're just seeing their children in front of the computer and uh, they, because of that, they are um, not happy. And I'm certain I wouldn't like that my children are uh, in front of the computer for eight to ten hours. Um, so uh, uh, it's not uh, it's not easy. But um, education and and uh, raising awareness is the most important thing. We need to talk. We need to uh, discuss things. Uh, the, we need uh, as educators to hear the the community. And we have to explain to them uh, what we are doing and why they are, we are doing uh, uh, some things, you know. And um, definitely the pandemic uh, showed that some things which were, uh, for example, said they are not possible to happen somehow, actually they did happen over the night, you know. I was talking to te for 10 years to teachers that they could make a move and they were talking to me, saying to me that it's not possible and then pandemic hit and suddenly it was possible, you know. Mm -hmm. So, on in one point, pandemic was a good challenge and, and a catalyst that things can change and, and they did change. Um, on the other hand, it showed uh, how, how poorly it can be done. Because basically, during pandemic, what we did, we, we tried to maintain education to go on. We didn't focus on the quality. And this is where we have to do uh, uh, lots of things, you know, uh, focus on quality. And uh, for parents, yes, it's not easy to provide the uh, internet or laptops if, ha if you have, even if you have more children, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a difficult. Uh, but um, I, 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 I work with teachers and, and I also support students and I often have calls from parents saying, um, my son cannot enroll in the course. Um, why my daughter didn't uh, um, get the, the better grade in this and that? Um, and mostly they do not understand the educational process. You know, we have the, the saying in Croatia, uh, in Croatia knows the best uh, about the football and education. You know, everyone expert in football <laughs> and education. Uh, but we are actually not. We are actually not, and we should leave the things like that to experts to deal with that. We can be interest uh, parties, but we cannot decide if it's good or bad because we are not educated uh, in that. And uh, we should uh, trust the experts, the educators, uh, to do things uh, because they know they know how to do them. Thank you for that. And Amy, I think uh, with two minutes left, I may leave the last re response to you. What advice would you offer teachers um, to improve the experience of online uh, online learning? Yeah, um, so at Future of School, we have been giving grants to teachers who want to transform their classrooms for the last seven years. So it's a traditional brick and mortar classroom that they want to integrate a blended learning program for their kids. And what we've learned in doing that is it doesn't take a lot of money and it doesn't take too much time. It really is a teacher knowing and understanding their students in their classroom with an idea of if I had these iPads, if I had this technology, if I had this, these resources, I could change and transform this classroom for my kids. So I would say to educators, first of all, that you're, you're beyond wildly appreciated for all that you do, even though sometimes it doesn't feel that way. And secondly, if you don't, you know, don't be afraid. We, we often feel like, okay, we have to have it perfected versus being progressive in how we use technology. 
using it a little bit and engaging your students in that process, asking them how they, how would you use this technology? What would you do? What could we do to make this more interactive and more engaging? They have amazing, incredible ideas. So creating that collaborative environment and starting small and building as you go are ways to sit in your power and make change in your classroom without waiting for policies to change or without waiting for funding to come from a district. Fantastic. Um, we could keep going at this for the next few hours, uh, but alas, we are out of our time for today. And I just want to thank you all for taking the time uh, to join us and answer those questions. And I, I certainly know if we ever get shut down again, you three are going to be getting calls from my wife and I first um, when we get our kids back online. So thank you so much for making the time and uh, I wish you the very best uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Bye.